So welcome everybody who's joined. Um, this is a uh, very uh, uh, skilled and experienced panel discussion on the topic of e-procurement. Um, and so this is the right group of people we have to talk about how to make it easy with e-procurement integration. So if this is a topic you're interested in, you are in the right place. Uh, we'll introduce the panelists here. Uh, I'm your host for today. I'm Aaron Sheehan. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Oro Commerce. And then I will let the rest of the uh, panelists introduce themselves, starting with Adam. Hi, everyone. Adam Sheets, the Director of Digital Commerce here at ECO. And essentially what my role type looks like is I sit in between our ERP system and how that ERP system interacts with the outside world, be it the vendor community, customer community, and so uh, how we facilitate interacting digitally with customers. Uh, ECO is a regionally... Uh, based in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and we are an industrial distributor uh, specializing in automation and power solutions. Fantastic. Thank you, Adam. Joe, you're next. Yeah. Hey, um, Aaron, thanks for having me. My name is Joe Albrecht, Managing Partner and CEO of X Engage. We are a digital services firm implementing the Oro Commerce platform as well as Trade Centric, and obviously Honored and excited to work with Adam Sheets and his team at Eco uh, for, I think, a couple of years now. So glad to be on. Thank you. Fantastic. Last but not least, Kevin. Hey, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to uh, be a part of this conversation. So I'm Kevin Kazemeyer. I'm the Vice President of Channel Development at Trade Centric. And we're an integration platform that connects B2B buyers and supplier systems through Throughout the flow of the procure to pay transactions, including documents like automating purchase orders and invoices. And basically our platform, it translates document data, allowing e-commerce and e-procurement systems to basically speak the same language. Fantastic. And uh, a final note on uh, Oro Commerce, we are of course a B2B e-commerce platform uh, that works with manufacturers and distributors uh, across the mid-market and enterprise. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now uh, because this is a panel, not a presentation. Um, and the interesting thing is going to be the dialogue between everybody here. So uh, a few housekeeping notes. This is a Zoom webinar. This is recorded. Uh, and so we will be sending it out to attendees afterwards uh, if you need to watch it again. And I'm sure that you will want to. Uh, there are controls at the bottom of your screen for uh, questions and answers and chat. We will be taking uh, Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have questions, please click the Q&A bubbles at the bottom of your Zoom webinar controls. Put in your question. Uh, if you address your question to a specific person because it is somebody you want to talk to, just note that in your question. There will also be a couple of poll questions that will pop up from time to time. Uh, these, are, these are questions for you, the audience, to answer uh, about yourselves and your businesses. There will be two. Um, they are minimally invasive, I promise. Um, so please, when you see them, please just uh, click the answer that makes the most sense for uh, you and your company. And with that said, we got a lot of attendees here today. This is a pretty good turnout. You guys draw a crowd. Um, good work. We'll go with the uh, first question. And the first question is going to be over to Kevin. So Kevin, um, given your background, and Trade Centric's expertise in e-procurement and the integrating of e-procurement systems. Can you kind of set the scene uh, for everybody on the overall market and key trends about what listeners should be aware of and how the space is evolving? Yeah, sure, Aaron. So, you know, if you think about it, e-procurement is really, it's exploding right now. And it's happening on both sides of the order cycle, both with buyers seeking ways to streamline the procure to pay cycle and enhance compliance, while as well as suppliers who they're trying to accommodate these customers' requests to show up and integrate in these procurement systems. And according to research from uh, DC360, actually recent research from DC360, DC uh, e-procurement sales, they've increased 16% from 2022 to 2023. And in fact, there's been double digit growth in e-procurement sales the last three years. So there's a huge opportunity for suppliers to leverage e-procurement as a strategic sales channel that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Fantastic. And I think um, some of us have been around, uh, there's another term that's sometimes used for um, 
e-procurement and what, what your solution does. What's that called? Touch, That's touch connected up. commerce. Connected yep. commerce. Yeah. So right. I mean, and I can I can expand a little bit about what connected commerce is, um, if you'd like. Yeah, let's do a quick lightning round and just make sure that the audience is aware of the terms that we're using, what e-procurement is, kind of what punch out is, what connected commerce is. So Kevin, you could you started us off already, so we'll go to you and then we'll move around the room. All right, sounds good. So, you know, you hear the terms e-procurement, punch out you know, uh, purchase order automation, invoice automation. Well, we like to call it connected commerce. So connected commerce is really the automation between supplier e-commerce systems and buyer e-procurement solutions. And it really helps drive frictionless transactions from shopping to order placement and invoice receipt. So punch out, it, it's really a key piece of this strategy and punch out connects the buyer's e-procurement system to a supplier's commerce system, essentially bypassing the traditional login process. And it really allows all users to access the supplier storefront where they can search and browse and access all of their preferred products, including their pricing, their inventory, and basically take that and return it back to their procurement platform. So punch out has really become table stakes for many suppliers to be able to continue to service their customers. Got it. Very good. Joe, you up next. Uh, what is your uh, what is your takeaway? What is your information for the audience on connected commerce, punch out, e procurement, and the overall landscape? No, it's. I mean, there's not much to add to what uh, Kevin ex uh, explained. Um, obviously, it's clear that uh, a lot of the larger customers uh, are procuring. Uh, not just from one supplier, but from multiple suppliers. And in that context, it's important for them to operate out of their procurement system, such as an Ariba or Cooper. And uh, um, obviously in that uh, setup, there is the classical EDI that uh, would operate behind the scenes between a, a buyer and a supplier. Um, or, and there is the punch out flow, which uh, allows customers to do exactly what Kevin said, to, 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 um, uh, look for products on a supplier website and then take the order behind the scenes back into the procurement application where typically there is some additional process around the buying uh, uh, on, in procurement uh, process, right? Approvals and things like this. And then they can uh, submit those orders. So it's really um, connecting all the different touch points that uh, customers expect today um, and, and, and connecting it into the seller systems or the supplier systems. Makes complete sense. Integration, you've got to integrate it. It doesn't work if you don't connect the systems. That's the whole value proposition. Um, Adam, over to you for the uh, final answer on this. What is your version of e-procurement and punch out? How does that look for you on the on the on the eco side? Yeah. So to to kind of help with adoption on our side of the fence, especially with the sales team to to get their minds around the concept, we have and maybe it's just our vernacular, but we call it portals. Our salespeople are used to dealing with these portals of all many of kinds. And so we use that terminology for them to kind of help them understand, hey, when we when we integrate on a punch out solution, imagine a world where you don't have to go to that portal to service them. It will happen for you because the data will be flowing back and forth. You can live in the in our ERP, in our system, and their buyer can live in their system. You guys don't have to go to this middle ground anymore to try and reconcile your documents and do all that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's a way that we kind of help encourage our salespeople to understand why they should be, if they're one, to help bring opportunities to us, because there's a lot of customers we don't know about might be have moved or are moving to a new portal or things of that nature. So, hey, if you're going somewhere other than our business system, let us know about it because we we should integrate with that. Um, so that's kind of a, a big takeaway for us. That makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. It sounds like there's a lot of demand for this, or there should be demand for it. Kevin, I think you guys have some stats and have done some research of your own on that, actually, the demand side for-, for Yeah, e yeah. So Adam brings up a good point, right? Like they're, they're aware of what's out there and what's, you know, the potential, but, you know, it, it, a lot of people really aren't, right? And then they're not doing a lot about it. So- the, the growing demand for B2B connected commerce and what we're finding, we did a survey of 120 B2B suppliers, and we found that over 61% of those suppliers reported 
that more than a quarter of their customers are requesting some sort of e-procurement integration. But when you look at that and you unpack it even further, only 35% were actively investing in this channel. So it kind of tells us two things, right? One is that there's demand. And I think, you know, Adam underscored that, right? There's demand out there. There's things that you can do for it. But also he's demonstrating how the suppliers who invest in this capability, they will be better able to meet their customers' expectations to not only drive revenue growth with existing customers, but also with potential new business as well. Fantastic. So I'm going to launch the first of our two poll questions now. Um, and so everybody should see a, uh, a little interactive form on their side, uh, which is, do you have customers requesting for you to integrate with their e-procurement systems? Um, and the, the answers are yes, all the time. People will not stop talking about it. Yes, once in a while, occasionally somebody brings it up in a QBR or in a, a, a customer feedback meeting, and no. And so far, the clear winners for the answers are some flavor of yes. So I think uh, clearly, Kevin, this audience would agree with the research that uh, your team conducted. Uh, we're going to let this uh, question uh, percolate for just another moment. We're at 74% participation, which is fantastic. Uh, we'll see if we can get that number uh, a little bit higher over the next uh, minute, and then we will move on to the rest of the talk track. If you would like to move on with the rest of the talk track, you should answer the poll question. Okay, we're at uh, we're at just over a minute. We've got 80% participation, 82% um, participation. I'll go ahead and close it out. That is a fantastic number. Thank you all. Uh, and we will move on to the next uh, talking point, uh, which is going to be partly kind of a re-summary, right? So e-procurement is requisitioning, ordering the digital purchase uh, of, for suppliers. Punch out it facilitates the ability to automate that cart data transfer within the client's buying system, that Ariba Coupa system for seamless ordering. So let's talk about how valuable this is. Um, Kevin, I know uh, you guys commissioned a study called Delivering ROI Value, and you looked at streamlining operations and driving profitable growth. Can you share the highlights of the research that, that you did with this group? Yeah, sure. So about a year and a half ago, we commissioned a study by an independent research firm, the Hobson and & Company. And we found that supply-side organizations who invested in trade-centric B2B connected commerce solutions generated an average ROI of five to seven X over a three-year period. Now that ROI included time savings to the you know, tune of an 80% reduction in time spent on purchase order management and 75% on invoice creation and management. But that's not it. I mean, also there's been a, a tremendous ROI in the growth side. And on average, and, and this is conservative, right? So we, we've seen from our customers a 20% increase in revenue from both new and existing customers from being able to meet them in this space. And so what we find is that, you know, happy customers are paying customers. And in, in, in when you connect them and you connect the invoice side, the average DSO or day sales outstanding cycles, they're also reduced by three to five days. And, you know, what organization wouldn't want to see a, a lot of less time spent on tracking down invoices and getting paid and also seeing a 60% reduction in the overall IT resources aligned to kind of make it all happen. So, you know, just with that kind of said, I know, Adam, I, we've talked a little bit about this, but how does some of those stats resonate with you? Uh, significantly in the sense that um, we had a lot of just – we had several customers who, when we started this level of integration with them, just in the discovery phases, making sure our, our systems were starting to talk to each other. I mean, we've had customers where they're like, oh, I didn't realize you only had these four or five ship twos because of our region. They're like, did you know that you have, here's these other ones. And they would just give us more ship twos. So it wasn't only just that we were providing a good level of service to the facility, the this conversation allowed us to go higher up to the corporate level and talk about serving our our company serving their company and doing best by their company not just by one facility we're able to 
make it easier on their buyers so that they can consolidate their time spend and things of that nature to where it's good for us because it's getting us a larger order value and allowing us to just be more sticky uh, within that buyer side of the organization. That's super solid. And I think, um, I mean, Adam, at some, at some level, you know, you're the star of the show. You're the actual, uh, you're the actual company that's implemented this and is seeing the benefits from it. So I think people would like to hear a little bit about your perspective, your the journey that Eco went on. Like what, so um, you just kind of outlined some of the benefits, but let's walk backwards in time. What prompted sure. you to start exploring punch out and e-procurement? And when did you feel that it was the right time to do it for Eco? Because I know from my experience, Punch out and punch out is never like part of the MVP originally for a site launch or like a channel launch. Right. Uh, usually, it's always added in as a result of, of feedback. So, walk us through a little bit of the history. So, I'd love to say we had everything planned out and we just ran it perfectly. Uh, that was not the case. Uh, zoom back uh, probably about five years ago. Now, we had one of our uh, top tier customers um, come to us and say, "You need to do this." We know that this is going to be hard for you to learn. We like you guys and we want to keep you around. We've been doing business with you for 50 plus years. But if you don't do this, we can't continue forward. We will be your guinea pig. So hop on it. And so during that time, we had a different ERP system. We had a different e-commerce platform and we bootstrapped it. We were like, well, we just got to do it because that's kind of how our company culture was back in the day. It was just make this one thing work and let's move on. And uh, we sat there and we we figured it out. It was a very arduous process, but um, it was able to cement a very strong ongoing relationship. And then from there, uh, it opened our eyes to the benefits of the revenue side. We started seeing the that customer go even further than they had been before. And it very quickly dwarfed. Uh, we tended to bucket all of our our revenue through the the storefront as just one type of storefront. But for this particular reason, we pulled the customer out just to see how different it was. And that one customer was doing more business than all of our other e-commerce customers combined. And so we immediately go, wait a second, we need to be looking at this. Uh, fast forward a little bit, right at, at, right at COVID is when we decided to move our ERP system and our e-commerce platform, which is when I got involved with all the parties here. Uh, the reason why we went with TradeCentric is we had a minimal viable product uh, with our own bootstrapping methodology, and we learned through that process. It can be done on your own, but it is hard <laughs> to manage that and to scale its effort. And so we partnered with you all. Um, and then with Oro and with Xengage to do our implementation of the new site. So uh, we went that route and we did have it baked in on the next iteration. So it was a part of our original scope. Uh, we made sure that we had everybody picked out first and that we could run with that implementation. And now we're at the, the maintenance phase where we're just adding new um, and we're going one customer at a time. Solid, solid answers. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, proper planning in advance saves you a lot of a lot of uh, hassle later on. So yeah. we might have some. I'm guessing, and I haven't looked at the attendee list, but I'm guessing there are some manufacturers uh, on today who would like to know how do I support a distributor who wants to use this. Um, what would you advise them? A supplier. Mm -hmm. Okay. A um, yeah. So like a manufacturer supporting a distributor to do this. So mm -hmm. with that, I mean, um, from a supplier side, I think leveraging your, uh, your data is the best thing that you can do. Um, it helps make the distributor system cleaner, more concise, especially when you start talking about product data, because now the customer is going to be shopping on our site. And we want to make sure that your products are properly represented in there. So using partner data feeds or having a direct data feed connection but going through that data hygiene and hierarchy to make sure that your distributors have clean information because that's what's going to be presented to the customer on the storefront. So that would be my biggest thing is um, support them with clean data. Yep. Gets overlooked a lot, I found. Um, well, there's just so much to have now. I mean, it's gobs of data. So I don't, I don't envy them at all, but 
Imagine being a distributor, not only dealing with your data, but 30, 40, 50, 100 <laughs> other people's data too. It, it gets messy quick. It does. What? So I'm super curious then, um, you know, we heard Kevin talk about the the study that uh, that they commissioned on the the ROI. What's Ecoscene in terms of ROI? What? How is life different for you now that you've adopted yeah. trade-centric Oro, you've used Xengage to do it? What's changed? Yeah, so um, overall, when we we look at it just from a revenue side, we've kind of 5 x our overall revenue. Now, when you look at that, when you first start, we were less than a half a percent of overall company revenue when we launched on e-commerce. But now we're getting into that 2 3 5% overall revenue. Um, you start adding in other means of digital, uh, digital uh, connections like EDI and those types of things, those numbers continue to grow. So, you know, when you look at that specific scope of how we're measuring trade centric and e-commerce performance through or through Oro, um, we have seen significant growth there in user adoption and the amount of customers that are uh, creating those profiles and building it. But specifically for trade centric, um, we are seeing uh, getting those customers on board, it has opened a lot of doors and communications for us to increase uh, our ship to counts with customers to allow us to scale to a higher level of conversation than we have before to get closer to the buying side. Um, and that has just overall made their company performance uh, rise up in, in revenue. Awesome. Not, so it sounds it's like this all that. It's a huge holistic approach too. You know, it's I don't want to give everybody just one side, but it has made so many things uh, smoother in the transition. And having cleaner product data and data to begin with benefits yeah. everybody, right? No matter who in the org. So that's fantastic. All right. So we're going to launch the next poll question. Um, does Adam's story sound like your own? Has your organization faced any of the same challenges or gone through the same process even? Uh, and it's real simple. It's either yes or no. Um, so well, answers are pouring in. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of people out there, Adam, who resonate with Eco Story because there's definitely uh, the yeses are winning. Yes, you're not on well, your I own. Got a, I got a lot of bumps and bruises, scrapes and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So be, I'm glad I can share some of that with y'all. Yeah, fantastic. And I would say, too, if anybody uh, is interested in uh, talking to Adam afterwards or really any of the panelists uh, about their experiences, uh, feel free uh, to, to reach out to us afterwards. Uh, we're happy to. I know Adam is especially happy to talk to other folks in his in his position. So we're going to give it another 15 seconds or so uh, to let the respondents trickle in. It looks like we are right at about 70% participation. So I will go ahead and stop the poll here. All right. Very, very good. Uh, okay. So let's hear, uh, Joe, you've been real quiet. We I've not picked on you uh, very much yet. So now I'm going to pick on you. Um, I know you look at digital strategy uh, alongside your clients. Uh, and you've had experience implementing these kinds of systems before as the service provider, as the solutions integrator. So I'm I'm curious about some examples where clients were proactive versus reactive. So it sounds like initially Eco was reactive, a client demanded it, and so they had to go build custom stuff, and then they became proactive when it was pro proven out. What have you seen from, from your side in terms of proactive versus reactive? Uh, both. Um... Both scenarios apply, I think. I'm not sure if Eco was uh, reactive. I think they had a very strong strategy, but it's always inspired by what the customers of uh, the supply side needs, right? Like uh, Adam explained, a customer had expressed a desire to buy via punch out and that drove some of this. I have seen both and um, going back like some eight years uh, when we uh, specialized on building uh, connected uh, commerce solutions for B2B environments, and we built our first uh, um, trade-centric integration. The, the impetus was definitely reactive. It was typically e-commerce was leading. We need a storefront. We need the ability for customers to place orders online. And then they went live, and then our punch-out uh, fairly soon actually followed suit. So um, 
Uh, I'm very intrigued. So I think, Kevin, you mentioned 35% of, of the, the folks uh, out there are, are making use of punch out. That is consistent with our experience. Looking across our entire client portfolio, we're finding about 35% have implemented punch out. Um, that said, I had the client in the Shenzhen space uh, supplying hotels and other large uh, entities, government entities. And uh, I will not forget that call when um, we actually uh, had a meeting and I was told we have a customer, they will leave us, they are doing 50% of our revenue. We need uh, to be able to do punch out. How can you help us? Well, and obviously uh, here the focus was 100% strategic uh, and, and almost like survival mode uh, on getting punch out. Uh, uh, implemented, which we did also with Trade Centric back in uh, a couple of years ago. So the web experience, the, the you know the storefront was really just a vehicle to making that punch out catalog uh, um, come to light. And so it's very important what Adam said. Um, if if you're starting in this whole space of connected commerce and digital commerce, good product data, hence the focus on product information management, whether it's a PIM system or more from an operational perspective, that's the currency of, of doing any of that. Then second, having that catalog exposed on a website, uh, ideally, of course, for other reasons than punch out, but that's a prerequisite for a punch out. And then of course, you know, making it work uh, so that you can have your customers that do 50% of revenue with you do that out of their procurement applications is a, a survival strategy nowadays. You, you cannot not have it. Um, so I've seen that definitely uh, being the leading um, factor. And I will wrap it here with a comment. I had other clients, they launched the e-com first, and then they found new opportunities to increase the revenue and the value of the web property by you know making use of the website as the punch out catalog and, and simply add that as another channel to it. That's very common actually, a lot of our clients um, combine strategies. They don't just put their bet on one simple thing being the website or just the punch out. They, they, it's always a multi-factor story at the end of the day. Um, the question is only, you know, how do they sequence it? Or typically it's not a big bang Typically, one focuses on what is the more uh, impactful um, area for the given business, right? Yeah, yeah. I want to add something to that. I think uh, another way of saying a lot of things that Joe just said, I've I've said this to our, our sales team to make sure that they help understand the differences, right, between punch out versus e-commerce and how they're the same. They're different, but they're the same, you know, your punch out application is just a super charged, super, um, the next level up of a web storefront. You need to have that in order to get the benefit of the punch out application. Cause you got to punch out to something, right? So if you don't have something to be punched out to, you can't have, you know, you can't have the punch out integration. So I teach them the website and then I show them, Hey, imagine this on steroids. That's for your big customers. For your smaller customers, this is a great application for their everyday use. Both of them use the same thing. One is just a, a level above to handle the, 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 the bigger e-procurement side. And there's a question, Aaron, in the, in the uh, um, chat here. Someone is asking along those lines. It's, it's the answer to the question is really what uh, Adam just said. There is there are certain customers that you might be supplying that simply have no procurement app. They don't have the financial means to run a, a big Yariba or SAP or what have you. So those would be your individual HVAC uh, or, or plumbers or electricians, what have you, right? If you supply those kinds of family oriented businesses, then there is no procurement app. There is no punch out ever going to be. Then there is a website and a beautiful customer portal where they can go and buy uh, uh, whatever they need to buy. But when you are working with clients like uh, Eco does that are, you know, billions in revenues and they are building large uh, solutions, maybe even construction sites, airports, what have you, they don't buy going to a website and they will never do that. So it, it's really um, catering to different um, customer personas of our suppliers. Uh, and, and that's what, what I think a multifaceted strategy is all about.
Yes, that was excellent. By the way, that was answering a question that came in via the Q and A tool uh, organically because it just popped up in conversation. I will uh, at the when we get to the Q and A section, I will reread the question just so everybody understands the question, and then maybe we can like quickly summarize the answer. I do want to do one last Q and A for everybody. This will be lightning round style, um, and we'll start. We'll go in the order that uh, everybody was introduced. So Kevin, Adam, Joe, um, which is the entire to all of you. Uh, there are always some pitfalls. There are always things, you always pay the dumb tax when you do something for the first time. Um, how would you advise listeners and attendees of this webinar about the process of getting started and optimizing their implementation to get the ROI that ECO has seen? And uh, Kevin, we'll start with you. Well, so I think the previous conversation kind of stole my thunder a little bit because I would I would say two things. One would be identify those target customers. Right. So when you think about it, you know, Joe mentioned not everybody's always going to be using the same things. Adam said that everybody's not always going to be ordering the same way. But what you need to do is first identify, look at your customers and identify what they're ordering, how they're ordering. And some in some cases, they're ordering on some sort of platform if they're not sort of a mom and pop or a small business. So first identify those industries you serve, look at your current customers determine if they have the capability. Maybe they never asked, maybe they never knew you were thinking about it, right? But then once you do that and identify there's an opportunity, then you need to go find yourself a partner, right? And, and you know, selfishly, I'll say that, hey, we're the, we're the right partner. But, you know, when you think about the risks and the rewards of your clients and the ROI numbers that, you know, should be helpful to tell you what the, the benefits are going to be, it should put you to a point where, I want to get to this as fast as possible. I don't want to take it take it longer to do it internally and figure out how to do it sequentially amongst platforms. I want to find a partner that can connect me quickly and drive sustained success through multiple platforms. Fantastic yeah, I'll, answer. I will uh, I'll piggyback off that in a lot of respects is it's really great to partner with someone because it's an it's an iterative process. You can't go in thinking this is a project I'm a one and done and I'm out we can move on to the next. This is a a process that continues to evolve and grow. And once you streamline your connection with your partner, that's great. Um, having that partner is great because you could also as a small shop, we don't have many bodies on our side of the fence. They are an extension of our team as well as we can hold them accountable. And that's been very beneficial to have that you know, ability to expand our uh, capabilities through that. Uh, I guess the other thing too is um, just be ready. No matter how well you plan, uh, there's a, a VP of sales in our organization. His favorite saying is we sculpt on a conveyor belt. And that is, this thing is always moving. You're never going to get everything perfectly right, so, but you can't afford to do nothing. So start and get going. And with the information you have, make the best decisions you can and know that you're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to turn. You're going to have to try something new and be uncomfortable for a little while. Uh, but that's, that's one of the things you just got to start. Um, and then I would say the last one is, um, if you're a smaller organization or midsize, actually it doesn't matter what size organization you are really, you want to make sure you have buy-in across the organization. Um, like I said, a lot of the ways that we surface up the information of who, who our targets are, whatnot, we get this information from all across the company. We get it from directly from our sales rep, inside sales team. We get it from our uh, accounting team. Uh, we also get it from our IT teams, ERP teams, because they're having to connect to different things. So we're sourcing information across the organization because while we don't have perfect buy-in, as I'd like to sit here and say, we still, uh, you know, are like a family and families have some drama time to time. Um, it's, it's still fun to, or still necessary to get that buy-in uh, at least at a high level to say, this is something we're going to support um, and having partners like those represented here will definitely give you the resources, the education, the stats to, to back up the, the cell that you're going to have to present across the organization laterally and, and vertically. So, Perfect. Joe, I, everybody took the, uh, the low-hanging fruit answers for you. Um, ID your target customers, 
find partners. It's an iterative process. Uh, be ready because you're sculpting on a conveyor belt and uh, have buy-in from your stakeholders. So what's left? What's left really, yeah. I mean, not much. I would say just don't overthink it. Uh, don't overdo this, the digital strategy thing. The best strategy is always the one that has uh, uh, gotten many of these clients uh, operate since 150 years uh, um, or, you know, between that and, and, and so on. Uh, so what has worked? Where are your customers? What are they demanding? Look for that and then team up with a partner like us who knows how to help with digital and bring digital to the table to solve these issues. Of course, partners like Great Centric and, and Oro um, to support that. And ultimately, there's different puzzles, uh, uh, diff different pieces to the puzzle. Uh, and there are some dependencies. So a partner like Xengage can help you untangle that and understand what, what might be done first, right? You're trying to do punch out without an, an, a website, like Adam said, to punch out to, you're already stuck. So really um, just get some advice, get some help, um, but don't overthink it, get going. And then um, these pieces can be uh, um, brought into the overall multi-channel digital connected commerce buying uh, approach at different points in time, depending on your priorities. Perfect. So that concludes the formal part of the uh, presentation of the webinar. However, there are a bunch of questions that have come in, um, one of which we've already answered, and I'll restate it, which is from a manufacturer supplier side, the target group are mid-sized large customers with a procurement system. That's a question. That's a yes or no question. And I think the answer from everybody was pretty much, yeah. Um, it's unlikely that small customers have any procurement system, question mark. I think the answer is, yeah. And I think, Adam, to your point, that's what the web is for, right? That's the, the this on steroids, right? Go to the go to the portal, the branded ordering portal that is the website uh, for the smaller customers. And then the larger ones probably have. They're the ones who have Ariba, Coupa, one of the large e-procurement systems. Um, and then is there an advantage? This is an interesting question because because she goes on to say, what is the advantage of punch out? versus EDI or a web shop from a customer and manufacturer perspective? Um, I would guess the answer is partially at least scale. Um, it's you reach more people uh, and once you have a scalable solution, but from the individual buyer perspective, maybe what's the difference? What's the advantage of doing it via punch out or EDI versus going into that branded ordering portal? And anybody can take this. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with this. I mean, all three of these fall under my purview here at Eco. And, and we did that purposely for this very reason is there's how people interact with our business system is kind of our channel to market. Now, how we do that, we have these different areas, EDI versus punch out versus web shop versus, you know, start naming them. So um, the way we typically look at this is most customers uh, want to have, and I say customers from our perspective, are usually um, transacting with us through an automation of internal PO stuff, um, or they're just sending us the PO to us and we automate that process on our side of the fence, or they're big enough that they have their own procurement system. So then we go punch out route. If they don't, we try to push them to the web route. We really like to only do EDI with our supplier side. Now, some customers will say, hey, we want to do EDI with you and we will do that. But most of those who are already in the EDI space tend to already be connected either to a portal or some other means as a facilitator of that. So we try to convert that business that was historically EDI over to punch out because it just has uh, more capabilities to it. There's more benefits on both sides of the fence than EDI. Now, from a supplier side, distributor to supplier, um, EDI is, in our opinion, a better methodology because it gives you a lot better file types around transactional datas of dates and all those types of things that we're looking for. So uh, when it comes to all the acknowledgements, while you can do that with a customer, and we've done that through our punch out stream, EDI seems to be a more of a preferred methodology for us to communicate to the suppliers. Very good. Uh, the next question is also for you, Adam. I hope everybody is uh, happy hearing Adam's voice. Um, so let's see, for Adam, as a company doing this for several years now, what is your e-commerce revenue mix percent, direct site percent, punch out connected commerce? How is each growing? You kind of talked about this a little bit, actually, just a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. So when we first launched e-commerce, um, probably six, seven years ago now, uh, it was 100% direct site, and that's how we were attributing it. And then we went to add in punch out. And it started out kind of a 75-25, and then within the next year, it flipped. 
uh, by one customer. And so that's when we started to investigate that and push it. Uh, since moving to our new ERP, new uh, platform with Oro, uh, we have had a, a, a larger surge of website customers uh, because we're doing a better job marketing. And we've actually gotten a lot of better just capabilities out the, you know, out the box as well as customized. And so um, with that, I would say our mix right now is about... Um, I would say about 65, 65, 35 split now. Uh, E-commerce is the lesser of the two. So we're still very punch out heavy, but that's where we can recognize that that's our best opportunity for growth. Now we need to service those, what we call our house accounts and those that are small that we might not have a salesperson assigned to. We need to make sure that we're still having a great uh, relationship with them. And we have been able to be successful in that by having the web storefront. Uh, but to push the envelope even further and quicker and, you know, gets everybody's heads turning is when you go at the punch out route, because you get that one whale on there and that changes your number significantly. Right. That makes sense. It's kind of a bell curve distribution where like the, you know, the long tail are smaller transactions somewhat. Yep. And the web, the web store is also an acquisition channel for you too, right? You may yeah. bring them in through the web store and then convert them to uh, on the revenue side to a punch out customer. Well, that's, um, last thing on that, sorry, I don't want to, I, I think it's worth mentioning that a lot of times a company can do these ordering in a multitude of mixtures they don't have to be oh you can only be this and buy this way you know we still have them coming from a sales rep we still have it coming from the web store we have it coming through an automation channel and this and they all still transact and we can simplify that on our side and make it better it's not like a oh well now you're a web store customer you can only be a web store customer yeah right makes sense a lot more questions coming in um once you have an active punch out option, this could be a question for anybody. Uh, what's a typical time frame to get a new medium to large customer set up to connect to the portal, either in labor hours or calendar time frame? And this is a question I think makes more sense, Kevin and Joe, for you guys because you're on the services side. You see these all day long. So, what is a a, a typical time frame? Yeah, so it's a good question, right? And and sometimes it the wild card really is the trading partner or buyer that customer that you're connecting to, right? So once you have that initial connection to your commerce platform and right until so like, you know, working with with uh, X Engage and Oro and getting it all connected, you know, that's the biggest lift. Getting your trading partners connected ongoing is going to be how quickly they typically engage. Usually, on average, best in the industry are going to set it at like a 30 day to 45 day timeline, right, depending upon the complexity, purchase orders, invoice integration. But, you know, it's all going to be how fast does your trading partner want to go and how quickly they're engaged? I've seen some turnaround in 10 days, you know? So again, if they're actively ready to support, you get them set up, you can go live in a short period of time. Typically you have a customer that runs through a series of testing procedures before you can actually turn them on. Makes sense. Joe, anything you'd add to that? Uh, no, I think it's exactly like that. There is a question also that probably is looking for that. Once you have the connectivity established, right, between your um, trade-centric hub, so to speak, and your e-commerce platform, which provides uh, the punch-out target, then it is fairly quick to add those different uh, uh, trading partners. Uh, there is not much to add to that. Uh, that's the primary reason why I think a trade-centric exists to take away all the technical plumbing that you would have otherwise to deal with if you did that internally. And I, that goes to the person who was asking that question about how do you, you know, what's the benefit, or how do we scale as more customers really want uh, punch out uh, capabilities? All right. Uh, do most suppliers who use Oro for punch out also use it for receiving POs and sending invoices? Um, I ask because we use Oro today and we had it developed out to set up and support punch out directly with customers. But since we receive POs through trade centric directly into our back end ERP rather than through Oro. So Kevin, this sounds like a question that would make a lot of sense for you. Well, yeah. And I think, I think um, Joe could probably it, it enhance this a bit, but I think it comes down to what the preference is of the supplier we're working with. Right. So 
some commerce platforms initially were set up just to be a, you know, transactional piece for, you know, walk up and, and registering and ordering online and punch out with something new. So in some platforms, punch out was considered an abandoned cart, right? Because it was disconnected from the process. They've soon, you know, quickly um, advanced, right? And they started recognizing, okay, punch out is part of the platform and we need to figure out how to connect it all. So those platforms, you may, you may have implemented it five years ago before the platform, you know, advanced and grabbed, you know, built all those capabilities to accept an order and drop it into your ERP. So it really comes down to supplier preference and also how, you know, well connected your systems are. So if you're leveraging your commerce platform to drop an order into your ERP for order processing, the best way is probably to process it through and back out because it's that single source of truth. But again, some suppliers have chosen, I'm going to leverage my ERP for my order management and for my financials, and I want everything delivered out of there. So it's it's flexible, but you know, I don't know, Joe, if you have any other thoughts about what you've seen from that side. No, exactly. Both both paths are valid and available. Either the orders flow directly to the ERP or they go through the e-com platform. I believe, uh, Adam, with you guys, we implemented POs and invoices going into- Yeah, we uh, flow- we flow them through Aura. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine that also depending on a customer from a customer service standpoint or having one place to go to look up that information as opposed to having to log into two different systems potentially save some time on the back end when you're trying to figure out current status of an account. Um, so many people use their e-commerce platform as like a portal into the ERP anyway. So and that's, and that's a great time. point. I don't know, Adam, if you could share. So a lot of a lot of platforms, you know, struggle with delivering order status back through the punch out experience. And I would think being able to accept orders and invoices through the commerce platform, you're able to serve that up better to them. And, and is that something that you take advantage of? Yeah. Um, and that was actually as part of this late stage, uh, one of our last customers we just onboarded, they needed to have those PO acknowledgements as well with, you know, shipping dates and all that fun stuff. And uh, our ERP is a SQL backed um, application. So we have a SQL developer in house and the way in which we communicate with Oro is a, a mixture of uh, flat file transfers as well as uh, real time API calls for a variety of mixtures. So in that we were able to take the order in real time and then use the, the data that confirms come back through that same pipeline due to a SQL view that came back. But I was just going to add to all what you guys said. It, it really comes down to your architecture. You know, how do you want to funnel the data to you? And that's where trade centric, I think, is the tip of the spear for you is you have the ability at the trade centric level to figure out what system you want to communicate with on your side of the fence. There was a day in our previous, uh, you know, before we were with Oro that we were doing e-commerce punch out through the, the website, but the rest of it did it EDI flow back to us because that's how our system could only handle it. Now today, because our platform is better as well as our ERP is better, we're able to streamline that in a better architecture. So it goes trade-centric, Oro, ERP. Perfect. Okay, and we're gonna get through as many of the questions as we can in the time allotted, but um, if we don't have time to get through them, uh, I will take the questions that are unanswered and distribute them to the panelists and we'll get you, uh, as long as you're not anonymous attendee, I may not know how to how to get a hold of you afterwards. Uh, so throw your information in the chat or or, or LinkedIn DM somebody. Um, a question to Kevin: We work with manufacturers, distributors, and suppliers. What are some additional pain points we should keep an eye and ear out for when working with our clients so we can help them achieve connected commerce when they're not aware that connected commerce is the answer? Oh, well, that's a great question, right? And and there's there's two answers I have for this. One is. You know, before I worked at Trade Centric, I actually was in Adam's shoes and worked for a distributor, worked for the the connecting all the different systems and getting customers connected to e-procurement. And what I like to do is I like to work backwards. And I taught our sales team to ask the questions of, tell, take me through your ordering process today with me, right? Walk me through all the steps because a lot of what, what people see is I hand you the PO, but what they don't see is, you know, to Adam's point, do they need an advanced ship notice? Are they looking for status? Are they calling customer service? How are they receiving their invoice today? And are they able to pay in time? What's the lift around getting an invoice approved and paid? 
So when you start looking backwards and going backwards through the process, finding products on a site is easy, but all the rest of that stuff is where the pain exists. And that's typically where some someone in your sales organization doesn't always look because they're taking the order, they're walking in, they're saying, yes, I've checked sale, right? But if you start looking backwards and digging in, you're going to find the pain points in, in those particular areas. The other thing is really going to your own customer service team and finding out how many of your customers are phoning in or sending you an email that includes a purchase order number? Because again, it's just out of sight, out of mind. I'm not thinking about it. I'm, well, I'm just getting an order and not realizing that order originates in some system that has to generate a purchase order. So there could be an opportunity to connect. Yeah, yeah, probably a lot of emails with purchase order numbers at the bottom in my, in my experience. <laughs> um, okay, uh, another one to Adam. How do you determine which customers you integrate punch out with? Is it anyone willing to connect? Do they have to have a certain amount of spend? Is there is there other criteria? Yeah, so we first uh, prioritize it by who we're doing business with uh, already in in a known portal, and we reach out to them. Sometimes it takes a while to figure out who the right person actually is to talk to. So. Um, starting a lot of those conversations early will definitely pay off dividends in the long run. Um, and so we go for there and we just tell them about the benefits of getting deeper connected with them. Um, and then usually, you know, obviously in their, to, do, to do this level of integration, they have to be a part of that conversation. So it's we ask, hey, we'd love for you to do this and not. Now, we have had some recent success that... Um, now that our sales team is getting a, a much more holistic uh, idea of what this whole thing even is and how to sell it, they've been able to find a couple of uh, things that we didn't even know about. And they've been able to bring those to our attention. So um, I think just getting people to understand what you're trying to do and get that buy-in. And honestly, you know, what comes to mind is just servant leadership. You have to have that mindset of, I want to help you uh, help them, you know, cause that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to help their customer. And so, yes, you need their, the customer to be willing to participate in the punch out opportunity. That makes sense. I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking of what, of Kevin's previous answer to the earlier question about the working backwards and thinking that as you do that diligence and analysis on your side to see what are all the touch points that are coming in, uh, that also might, that will suggest some customers, I would imagine, if you're going in and, and sort of auditing the communication uh, yeah. with folks. Some people are going to jump out probably in uh, bright flashing neon lights as like, oh, these guys would be a good a good person to reach out to. Yeah. And just like anything too, I think there was something in there about the spend is you need to have enough spend that it makes business sense for you. But, you know, most people don't have enough to start out. So start out with the ones that makes the most sense and then maybe get that whale that will kind of pay for everybody else, if you will. Yep, makes sense. So here's an interesting question. Um, and this is for anybody that wants to take it. Um, what do we see as main factors for companies not being willing to invest in a procurement platform, parentheses, aside from cost? So you can't say cost. Uh, how do we sell the benefits? Well, I, think, answer at once. I, I would think Aaron, a, Adam should give us his first take on how he sold okay. it in, in within his side, and then we can kind of make additional pointers. <clears throat> um, beside cost. Well, I will say this just as a, as an aside is uh, I had a, a sales, uh, one of our VPs tell me, you know, we've made a lot worse decisions with uh, more money than what we would going with uh, a trade centric to even get this off the ground. So I will say that, that if you're looking at this from a dollars and cents perspective, uh, there's probably plenty of opportunities that sales, the sales side of the organization has probably tried to implement something at a much higher dollar value or total cost of ownership than what the trade centric platform is. So I will say that they, they are very strong in that perspective. Um, but how the, the focusing on the benefits and things like that, I think if you get that one win and you, you show them that, Hey, this is going to increase our, um, our influence within the organization, within the customer, it's going to get us talking with the corporate side is going to get us talking with the buyer side. 
and has the ability to open up doors like more ship twos and a higher order value and things of that nature. Uh, that's kind of what I focus on is opportunity. Because if you think as a salesperson, they live and die on the opportunity. So you got to have to start talking their their language a little bit about what is the potential opportunity that their customer already is and what they're leaving on the table by not having this conversation. I, I think those are great points. And I, I would add to it, right? The the thing that you, your point about, you know, the cost and the level of investment and you've spent so much more on doing other things, what's commonly overlooked is it's just the fear of the unknown. I don't know what e-procurement is. I don't know, you know, what the potential is, but being able to show where the 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 market is going and that, you know, it's over trillions of dollars now coming through e-procurement channels and that even if you're a mid-market player, look at the industries you're selling into because if you're selling into like an example, higher ed, everybody in higher ed is ordering on a procurement platform. And if you think that you're getting business or the entire book of business from that customer and you're not integrated, you're not. You might be getting specials. And I, I keep referring back to a friend of mine who runs e-procurement at, at a supplier and she tells people, she gives this advice. If you're not showing up in their procurement platform, you're not their number one choice. You're probably their fourth or fifth, right? So that's a way to sell it to your leadership is like, if we're not showing up, we're not visible, they're not really thinking of us. Solid, solid. You've got to be, you got to show up if you want people to uh, to spend on you. We are at time. There are a couple of more questions. I would encourage the folks. Uh, it looks like there was a question for Adam and a question for Kevin. I would encourage you, uh, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous attendee, to reach out directly uh, to those folks uh, with those questions. Um, but we are at time. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, the recording will be distributed to all the attendees later. A lot of good advice. Thank you very much, panelists, for your time and experience. This was super Thank educational you. for me. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Appreciate thank you. it. Thanks. Have a great day.